Thank you for being in church today. We'll all turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 16, if you would please with me. Book of Acts, chapter number 16. <clears throat> Acts, chapter number 16. And our subject has been the gospel identity. Who I am is who I am in Jesus Christ. Uh, the government may recognize me by a social security number, but the Father sees me covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? And to the insurance company, you may just be a policy, but to God, I'm his child, and he loves me, and he cares for me. Um, our gospel identity, it is our most prized identity. We may be identified in different ways here on this earth, but nothing is more important than who I am in Christ Jesus, being saved and born again. I'll ask once again, are you saved? Because it's only by trusting Christ that you get that wonderful identity, the great identity. You know, when my wife and I got married, she acquired a new identity when she married me. She even changed her name. My father-in-law is here today, Mr. Stanball. My wife was formerly Stanball, but now she is Sarah Davis. And I still remember, Dad, when you walked her down the aisle. And they said, who giveth this woman to be married to this man? And he said, her mother and I do. And uh, that day, her identity changed. <clears throat> and you know, when I got saved, my identity changed. Amen. The church is the bride of Christ. Aren't we? We are the bride of Christ. Amen. And he is the husband of men, and we are the bride. And, and we are made very much new in Jesus Christ when we're saved. And uh, I pray that you will trust Christ as your Savior. You must, you need be. The power of that gospel identity. <clears throat> since the beginning of July, I went through my records. We have been on this subject since the beginning, I think the first week of July. So July, August, September, and now here we are in October. But there's so much in the book of Acts. It's an it's a action-packed book uh, of, the, of the gospel spreading and going. Uh, we last left our heroes in chapter number 16. Uh, it was Paul and Silas and Timothy. And uh, Paul had originally in journey number one traveled with Barnabas. And then it was by the providence of God that now Barnabas travels with Mark and goes on a journey, a missionary journey, preaching the gospel. And Paul, the Bible says in, in uh, chapter 1540, just up a few verses before 16, Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So now Paul chooses Silas. And last week we looked at Timothy, or actually I mean, it was two weeks ago. We had a baby dedication last week. It was a wonderful Sunday. But two weeks ago we looked at Timothy, how that Paul had, had invested his life in the gospel and invested his life in people. And the gospel had changed a woman named... Uh, uh, Eunice and a mother named Lois, and they had raised their, their son and grandson, Timothy, in the things of God, and Timothy was a growing, flourishing Christian, and when Paul and Silas came back through, they were so taken by the spiritual growth of this man, Timothy, that they said to Timothy, we'd like for you to join us on the journey. We want you to come with us on this missionary trek. And so now, so now we have not just two, but we have Paul and Silas and Timothy. There are three on the second missionary journey. And the second missionary journey uh, makes its uh, way mostly beginning up north, and then it begins to head west. If I can sort of, uh, of course I'm doing opposite with my eyes, but you'll have to look at it with your own eyes. They begin to head north from Antioch, and then they begin to head toward west. But God changes their direction. And uh, or, or changes their 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 uh, idea of where they should go, and I want to start reading in chapter sixteen, uh, verse number uh, three, about this gospel identity. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders, which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Now verse 6. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, now notice this, and were forbidden 
of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Now that phrase is somewhat of a struggle for me. Why would God forbid anyone from preaching the gospel any place? Let me take a, a break here and sort of um, clarify. God wants us to preach the gospel everywhere, every place. There is not a wrong place to preach the gospel. There is not a wrong person to tell about Jesus. I heard someone say one time, they said, well, I just didn't feel like God wanted me to witness to them. What? God wants us to preach the gospel to how many creatures? Every creature, okay? Every creature. But you do understand that Paul and Silas and Timothy are journeying through a, uh, journeying through a, a pattern of cities and churches. And the question that must have been on their mind, what city? What region? What towns? What place? Where should we go? It's clear from the Bible that in regards to Galatia, after they went through Galatia, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. It is as if God said, I want you to go to a different place. Not that there were not people in Asia who needed saved. We all know that there would have been people, and now Asia was much smaller in comparison to what we figure as Asia today, not a continent, it was a smaller region. But we all know that there were unsaved people in Asia that certainly needed to hear the gospel. And you say, well, why wouldn't he go there? Well, there's unsaved people other places that need to hear the gospel too. Why not go there? But they wanted so intently to know exactly where God wanted them to go. And God made it clear and forbid them to preach the gospel in Asia. And so they didn't stop. They didn't say, well, we quit. The Bible says after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go to Bithynia. Okay, Lord. Asia is not the place. Bithynia is where we'll go. And here we have the Spirit suffered them not. So once again, closed door. And another time, closed door. Verse 8. And they passing by Mysia came to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia. And prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Isn't it true that life is a series of decisions? I mean, in truth, our life is made up of decisions. Paul was faced with important decisions. Important decisions about which cities to preach at. They were important decisions that would have gospel impact. And I don't have the time to really unravel uh, or to, to express all of this to us this morning. But they were decisions that Paul was making, being led by the Holy Spirit and by the Lord. They were decisions that Paul was making that have a gospel impact on you and me. And if you can study sort of the regional travel of Paul and his travels even into Europe, those decisions of travel have had impacted on you and I, even over here on this side of the world. They were important decisions. He had already been making hard decisions along the way. The decision not to take John Mark was a hard one, I believe. I mean, they had had great success on the last journey when it was Paul and Barnabas and Mark. And at the end of chapter number 15, the decision not to take Mark was a tough one. I believe the decision on who to take in his place would have been a tough one. Could you think of trying to replace who, who could possibly be the co-missionary with Paul? I'm being honest. I know I couldn't. I mean, that man had a certain uniqueness to him that, that when you traveled with Paul, it was serious business. So who is he going to choose? Well, he made a difficult decision, a hard decision, but a God-led decision to take Silas. And then we come to chapter 13 as we express what was, the what was, what was in entailed in the decision to take Timothy. And beyond that, as we looked at two weeks ago, how hard was it to decide that Timothy must be circumcised? 
I wouldn't have to make those choices either. But Paul was making hard choices, difficult choices. And then where to go? We're forbidden to go to Asia. The Spirit isn't suffering us to go to Bithynia. And now we have this vision from Macedonia. They were important decisions. They were gospel decisions. They were impactful decisions. And we can see the Holy Spirit leading them all the way along. You say, wow, that'd be, that's so nice. It's got to be so nice to have that kind of spiritual GPS. It's got to be so nice to have that kind of connection where God actually forbids you and leads you. Well, it is somewhat different from today, and I, I do want to at least make that uh, somewhat clear today. These men were still during the time of the completing of the Word of God. They didn't have what we have today, the glorious Bible that we hold on our laps. They didn't have that privilege. They had portions of the Word of God, of course, the Old Testament. But we know the book of Acts wasn't written yet. And I love the book of Acts, and it's helpful to me. And the Holy Spirit was indeed leading them and, and empowering them in unique and wonderful ways. And it might be helpful for us to examine the leading of the Holy Spirit for Paul and for Silas and for Timothy is more associated with a calling because the Bible says that when they saw the vision for Macedonia that they were sure now that God had called us to preach the gospel there uh, in Macedonia. But I, I said all that to say this, but aren't you and I still in need of God's leading? Now, I, I know that we can't take our day and put it on like an, like an overhead transparency sheet. You can't take exactly the way the Holy Spirit would lead us today and lay it over the way that the Holy Spirit led Paul and Silas during this very key time of gospel momentum. We can't exactly lay it over the same way. The word of God wasn't complete, and there were things that were in part that are now done away, and the speaking of tongues, and all of that we don't have time to get into. But it is true that we still need the Lord to lead. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Psalms 48, for this God is our God forever. He will be our guide even unto death. I am encouraged today and very thankful that in my Christian life, I don't have to lead my own way. Do you remember, some of you may be contemporaries with me, but when I was uh, younger, in my teen years, there was a series of books that came out that was called Choose Your Own Path. They might even have those books. Uh, called Choose Your Own Path. Anybody remember the old Choose Your Own Path books? Oh, man, I'm all alone here. <laughs> choose Your Own Adventure books. Yeah, Choose Your Own Adventure, maybe they call it. Sound, sound like, all right, so you start reading a book, right? And then you read like five pages, and, and the, you're, you're, you're in the story, and you're the main character. And now here you are. Uh, you're in front of this cave, and it's dark inside. Do you go in the cave, or do you go back to the farm? If you go in the cave, turn to page number 22. If you go back to the farm, turn to page number 34. Does that ring a bell? Anybody else not? Man, I must have been. Everybody else is reading like important stuff. And I'm reading uh, books like this. So I pick up those read or plan you know, your own adventure books and get to, you know, and, that, and, and that was like 10 times in the book. But if you don't choose correctly, you're dead. And if I would choose incorrectly through the book and end up dying, I would go back to the start and start, start choosing different things. So that hopefully I can get through the entire book with a happy ending. I want to say this. I don't want to live my real life that way. I don't. And here's the good news. You don't have to. You don't have to. In shady green pastures so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Some through the fire and some through the flood. And the chorus continues on, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. I also want to remind you of this. In the leading of God, don't wait for a Macedonian dream. <laughs> it 
Well, a preacher said that God's going to lead me, so I'm just going to wait for one of those dreams when somebody comes in the dream and says where i got to go. Or I'm just going to wait for some forbidding of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit leads us in that same identical way today. But I do know with all of my heart that God does lead his children along. I think there are some things in this text that will help us in regards to that leading. It's one of the great benefits of our gospel identity. It's the benefit that God walks alongside of us. It's the benefit that he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. It's the benefit that when Jesus departed and went back into heaven and those disciples were all un un uneasy because now their Savior has whooshed up into a cloud, Jesus said, fear not, I will not leave you comfortless. I will send the comfort of the Holy Spirit to you. The one thing that was on my heart in regards to the leading of God in the life of a Christian, the great joy of the leading of God in the Christian's life, is this. Make sure that you confirm your direction. Make sure that you confirm your direction. When Paul was making decisions, when Silas was making decisions, when they were seeking the leading of God, there were already some things that they had settled. There were a few key markers in their life that had already been nailed down and had already been set in stone. Or I may say it this way, the, the direction and purpose and desire of their life had already been well established. And because it had been well established, the decisions they needed to make were almost already made. It's hard to make decisions if you don't know where you're going. It's really hard. Because your decisions become short-sighted. An illustration that I wanted to use is, let's say, for instance, you got in your car and you said, it's Sunday, I'm just going to take a drive. So you have no place in particular to go. You're just going to start driving. And you know your decisions are going to be very shallow. Here's the way it works when I'm just, well, I don't think, I, I can't remember last time I just took a drive drive. But here's the way it will work if you're just going to take a drive. You come up to a red light. Why should I wait at this red light? I'm allowed to turn right, so I'm just going to turn right. It's a very shallow, short-sighted decision, but in the moment it seems like a good one, right? Or you'll be driving down 42 and just a little bit south of Grafton, and you'll see a Honey Hut sign up ahead, <laughs> and you'll say, hmm, that sounds good. I'll just pull in there. The line is short. I might as well just pull right in there. And what happens when you're just out for a ride, just out for a drive, your decisions are very short-sighted. But let's say, for instance, you got in your car and you said, you know, my, my loved one is in the hospital. I got, I got to get to Medina Hospital. I promise you, your decisions are going to be more clear. And your decisions will be more seriously grounded and your decisions would be more thought through rather than just out for a drive here's here's what happens in the christian's life we are just going through life like it's a drive i'm just sort of driving i'm just sort of loving my journey i'm just sort of having my fun here i'm just sort of kicking the tires enjoying the breeze I'm just sort of going through. But if you, if, you, if you are honest about Paul and Silas and Timothy, isn't it true that these men were absolutely driven? Driven. They had already made some large stake-driven uh, uh, anchoring decisions in their life. They were for sure completely surrendered to God. They had left everything. They left their house. They left their families, they left their friends behind, they left a great church back at Antioch, and they said, we are completely surrendering our time, our energy, our sleep, where we're going to sleep, what we're going to eat, where we're going to go, how we're going to walk. We are surrendering everything about us to, to God and to the Lord. Timothy left a loving mother and a loving grandmother and went on, on a journey with Paul and Silas because they had already made that decision that I will surrender myself to God. They were also driven by the gospel. There was not a day that went past that Paul and Silas and Timothy were not thinking, we got to tell somebody else that Jesus is alive. So focused on that. 
And they were also driven by the growth of the saints. They remembered the people that got saved on the last journey, and Paul couldn't get them out of his head. You read some of the other letters that Paul wrote in the New Testament, he's always listing names. Hey, greet so-and-so, and tell so-and-so hello, and tell so-and-so I'd like to come see him, and tell so-and-so maybe they can come see me. His mind was always on Christians that had been saved, and his desire was, are they growing? Are they doing good? Are they walking with the Lord? Are they advancing in their faith? So all of these big blocks had already been settled in their life and that made the lit the other decisions easy confirm your direction confirm your direction I want to encourage every man that is here today every husband that is here every father that is here decide that you're going to have a godly home just decide it we're going to have a godly home Sort of like Joshua did, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. That's what our house is going to be. That's our, what our marriage is going to be. That's what our family is going to be. That's the way I'm going to lead this family. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, dear brothers and sisters, just think through this with me for a moment. When a man decides we're going to have a godly home, a lot of other direction decisions have already been figured out by knowing your direction, by knowing your direction. When a young lady and a young man begin to date, begin to become interested in one another, young men and young ladies, please decide this. We are going to honor God with our relationship. We're going to live for the Lord. We're going to do right. We're going to wait until marriage. We're going to be pure. We're going to be holy. Do you know when you have already established that direction, so many other choices are automatically made. They automatically fall in place. And God leads us by those large decisions to decide that I am going to live separate from the world. This is, this is an important one. No man can serve two masters. Isn't that what Jesus said? Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So what a, what a freeing what, what, a, what a liberating thing and a, and a lifting of the burden it is for a Christian when the decision has already been made that my direction is, I'm, I'm going to live different from this world. I've already purposed in my heart that by God's grace I'll live different from the world. That takes care of so many other life decisions. I mentioned this earlier. How about living for eternity? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth and rust doth not corrupt and thieves do not break through nor steal. You can, you can usually pretty much tell when a Christian has decided, I'm not going to lay up treasure here. I'm laying up treasure there. You can see the evidence in their life because of the large decision that they made. May God help us to establish a direction because the, the, the decision-making of Paul and Silas was guided so intently by their decision to live for God and surrender to the Lord and give the gospel and cause the saints to grow. And I have another thing that I wanted to mention today, just two points and we'll be done. It won't be long today. But if we want to be led by the Holy Spirit, not only establish the direction of your life, but study the Word of God a lot. Study the Bible a lot. Paul and Silas and Timothy were in the Bible. They didn't, I've already mentioned, they didn't have the fullness that we have. But what was Paul's um, commendation of Timothy? And that from a child thou hast known, you remember? The Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Paul was deep in the Word of God and loved the Word of God. And whatever city he went into, he would make his way to the synagogue and open up the Old Testament Scriptures and begin to point out Jesus in Isaiah and Jesus in the Psalms and Jesus in Genesis and Jesus through the Old Testament. The Bible was part of his life. He was immersed in it. He was saturated in it. Is it any wonder that these men could make very good 
choices and decisions and, and follow great leading in their life as a Christian because they were so saturated with the Word of God. And I, I believe this with all of my heart, a Christian that is saturated with the Word of God usually automatically makes good decisions. Usually automatically makes good decisions. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Though thy through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate evil false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you have any moral questions in life, I, I, I'm, you say, well, things have changed today. No, they haven't. Morally, they're all still the same. If you have any moral questions in life, every answer is right here. Every moral answer. Every moral question is answered in the word of God. These aren't new battles. You say, well, this whole, you know, same-sex agenda is all new. No, it's not. Read Romans 1. It's always been. And every moral direction and decision should be based on an immersion of the Word of God. All moral matters are covered there. All knowledge of God that you can get is there. Everything you can know about God is there. We, know, we won't know Him in completeness until heaven, but all that you can know about God is there. Isn't it true that the promises of the Bible will help you in guiding your life? If you really know the promises of God, it makes walking through life easier to know what to do, where to go, how to go. How about the commandments of God that are in the Word of God? It helps us in the direction of our life. I'm saying with the gospel identity, we don't have to go through life alone. We don't have to choose our own adventure and die on page 56. We have the Word of God. How about the warnings of the Bible? We are, we are living in a day and age of warnings. The other day I was in the car and I, and I thought, what a mess all these warnings are on the visor. Have you seen the big stickers on the visor? You've got a beautiful interior of a car and got this big yellow sticker on your visor that you look at for the life of the car. And I was driving along and thought, couldn't they put that on the back side of the visor so you don't have to see it all the time? But no, the warning's got to be there, and we've got to let everybody know. If you buy an extension ladder today, it doesn't matter if it's 30 feet long. The whole side of the ladder has stickers on the whole thing all the way up on warnings that be careful. You might fall, and bad things will happen, and electric wires will touch it, and then you're dead, and all of these wires that just come <laughs> on, on the ladders. We are in a day and age of warnings, 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 warnings. The Word of God is filled with warnings. Filled with warnings. And those warnings, when we're immersed in those warnings, it leads us along. Leads us along. The Bible will mature you. Maturity brings the ability to make good life choices. Don't let a six-year-old make life choices. <laughs> hey, what do you think we should have for dinner tonight, little Johnny? How about suckers and ice cream in a bowl? And we're going to have those puffed cheese curls. And uh, don't make immature uh, young people make, make those important decisions. And as long as you and I, if we were to stay immature, immature as Christians, we're not going to make good life decisions either. It's the immersion of the Word of God that makes a newborn baby grow thereby. A mature Christian will make better life choices. An assured Christian will make better life choices. When you lack confidence, you make wrong choices usually. And being outside of the Word of God robs the Christian of confidence. In my years of ministry, there have been many times that I've counseled someone regarding the assurance of their salvation. And I just want to say my observance. And maybe there are cases that are different. But I have never yet dealt with someone regarding the assurance of their salvation, who has said this to me. Pastor, I don't understand why I'm doubting my salvation. I am immersed in the Word of God, and I still doubt. Never. It's always being outside of the Word of God when the doubt comes. You see? Being in the Word of God brings an assurance and a certain confidence. It's the kind of uh, confidence that was needed by... Uh, uh, by um, 
Joshua, when the Lord said uh, that thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all that according to therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And here's a general Joshua who just saw Moses die and knew all the grief that Moses had and said, how am I going to lead these people? And God said, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Do you know where Joshua got the confidence? From the words of God. It helps us to direct our life. The Word of God brings clarity and clarification, especially in a day when we don't know what truth is. The Bible always has truth. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul, of spirit, and the joints of the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I'm just saying immersion in the Word of God is what leads the Christian along. How about this? The Bible will clean your mind up. You don't want to make decisions with a, clean, with a dirty mind. The sin of the world and the things of the world that begin to penetrate the mind, where the Bible says that we are sanctified and cleansing by the, cleansed by the washing of water by the word. And in the book of Proverbs or Psalms, I believe it is, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Our immersion of the Word of God. We're talking about how do I lead my life? How am I going to make sure that I'm doing the right thing, going the right way, uh, 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 following the right path, and choosing the right adventure? Immerse yourself in the Bible. It cleans the mind, and a clean mind makes better choices. Amen. It increases our faith for tough decisions. Because some decisions are hard to make. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I just can't, I just can't do it, Pastor. I just don't know if I could do it. Immerse yourself in the Bible and faith comes. Faith comes. It keeps you from looking toward the world for wisdom. I was taught and I've learned it to be true. Never go grocery shopping when you're hungry. Because you will pick up everything. Would you think of this as I'm bringing this to a close? When you're satisfied with the Bible, you don't look anywhere else. You know why we're looking to Facebook for wisdom? It's because we don't have Bible. You know why we ask our friends what to do? It's because we don't have Bible. You know why there's even Christians who look to so-called earthly psychiatrists uh, TV personalities. Well, surely I'm going to follow them, though. Or, or entertainers, I'll follow them. Or, or, or sports things, I'll just follow them. You know why that quenches, that fills our hunger? It's because we haven't been filled with the Word of God. Because when we are saturated and immersed in the Word of God, the wisdom of God satisfies us. We hunger and thirst after righteousness, and we're filled. And that filling makes everything else, all the wisdom of the world, seem, who needs it? Who wants it? I don't need it. I have the Word of God. It will strengthen you. The Bible says a Christian is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Uh, it is his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And because he meditates in the word of God day and night, that makes him like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Have you ever tried to move a bush? I'm talking about small bushes. Hook your chain to it, hook it to the back of your Chevy pickup truck, or, your, or better yet, your Ford pickup truck, whatever it is, you hook it to the back. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Dodge. <laughs> hook it to the back of the truck and give it a yank and that you can watch them on YouTube pulls the bumper right off the truck the bush does try doing it with a tree you have roots that go deep strong strong roots meditation in the word of God gives you strength gives you strength and when you've got the tough steps to make in life and you've got hard decisions to make in and you're begging God, God, please lead me. Please show me. Please help me. Saturation with the word of God gives us good decision making. It's part of our gospel identity. There's a man named Mike Del Cavo. In 1993, 
he was running track in the NCAA Division II Track and Field Championships. It was a 6.2 mile race. There was 128 runners in this race. And so the, uh, the course of the race, the 6.2 miles, it was sort of all laid out with markers all through certain streets and, and towns and places. And, and uh, so they're, they're running through this, this big long uh, race and all the markers are there and 128 of them take off on this 6.2 uh, mile race. Toward the end of the course, Mike, who was in the middle of the pack, notices that the main pack of the runners had missed a turn. So he begins to wave and says, hey, you're going the wrong way. This is the right way. But he watches that huge pack. You know how they all run. They're all in a big group. That huge pack of runners just keep on going. And Mike looks back and only four people followed him the direction of the markers in the race, 1998. Well, he didn't finish the race first because the big pack that went the wrong way went the shorter way. And Mike, who went the right way, and the other four went the longer way. So when he arrives at the finish line, he sees all of these, you know, 123 other People there, or a large group of them, they're all at the finish line and happy. But he did what was right. He did what was the right thing to do. And only four others followed him in this longer portion, but was actually the right portion. And so now they have a decision to make. And the officials, the race officials, you can research this yourself. The race officials said, we got to figure out what we're going to do here. Because most of the runners went the wrong way. And I'll, I'll read it right from this, uh, this record that I have. In a widely criticized decision, the race officials allowed the abbreviated route to stand as the official course. And Del Calvo finished 123rd. Isn't that just like the world? The good guys finish last. But I'll tell you what. Let them have their trophy. Let them have their trophy. You know what is more comfort, I believe, in knowing that you did right? You say, well, yeah, but you did. according to the official uh, decision, he didn't win. Yeah? But I'm not trying to please a judge on a street. We're trying to please him. And in this life, there's always going to be the chatter of, you know, why are you doing that? Why are you going there? Why don't you just be like the rest of us? Why, why, why are you focusing so much on the Lord? You're over that church way too much. And I don't understand why you're so stuck on these Christian things. Why don't you loosen up a little bit? Why don't you live your life a little different? And all the chatter keeps going. I just want to say this today, church family. Let the unsaved go the longer way, or the, the wrong way. Even if it's longer the direction I'm going, if it's the right way, I want to stay on it. I want to stay on it. Because someday I want to hear my Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It's a blessing that God will still lead us. It's a blessing that God will still lead us, that he won't leave us alone, that he won't leave us comfortless. And I thank God for his leading today.